Ah, oh, what a what a creepy voice. That was comforting. Okay. Um, welcome. Hi. It's my birthday, and as the birthday boy, I'm going to talk about one of my favourite things, which is minotaurs. Um, specifically, one minotaur, actually, not minotaurs in general. Um, the talk is called Trapped in the Labyrinth, um, and I'm going to be looking at the uh, the minotaur um, of um, Greek and Etruscan myth from um, a queer perspective and a disabled perspective. The perspectives in question, like mostly are gearing towards trans, but like you'll see why I'm like, I'm staying trans, but like I mean queer as a whole um, later on. Um, the point of this talk or like the angle of this talk is not really to go into um, historical sources and nor is it really to talk about um, hard facts so to speak. So what we're going to be doing is we're going to be going through um, one of the um, some of the original iterations of um, the, the myth of King Minos and the Minotaur um, and then what we're going to be doing is we're going to be diving into the individual characters present in the myth um, as well as um, potential re-readings of the original themes um, in modernity from those queer and trans perspectives, uh, queer and disabled perspectives. So there's no um, like, uh, like hard reading material. Like obviously I'm gonna be drawing on um, stuff that's in um, Ovid and whatever else. However, um, the way that I was taught the myths as children does differ from um, some of the times where it's like explicitly written down. And because of the nature of uh, the stories that we're talking about, like, you know, several thousand years old and having undergone uh, multiple iterations as they've gone on, there's no true um, idea or like static uh, perception of any of these stories, um, which is gonna be like taken into account um, as we go forward. Uh, it's a really, really fun story. Um, the, I, was, I was talking to my editor earlier about this and like the, I guess the, um, the, like, the main goal of the presentation is really to um, uh, uh, get you thinking about um, like different perspectives on the myth and like encouraging you to sort of put your own biases on it and play with it. Because a lot of the time um, we focus a lot on like, um, period classical perspectives, which are really, really useful, except as um, creators and as modern readers, it's also also really valuable to um, to look at our own biases and our own experiences and not be afraid to um, to use those in relationship with the text that we consume, even if they're um, like parts of stories that are now like as much oral tradition as anything else. Uh, so that's the on we go. Um, this, why isn't it showing my notes? Never mind. Um, I have all the sources um, for uh, these um, pieces. I know which ones they are. Like I can link the, um, the Canva link to the presentation um, afterwards if people want the specific images. They're all on Wikipedia, so you don't have to look far. Um, I, didn't, I didn't look far because I only wanted uh, stuff that's in the, um, the public domain. So, start with the story. Now the story of uh, the Minotaur depicted here, this is um, like a, it's like a vase, it's a container, it's on uh, display in uh, one of the museums in Heraklion, uh, which is on the north side of Crete. It's also where um, you can actually go and visit uh, the palace of Knossos, which is King Knossos's, uh, King Minos's pa palace supposedly in antiquity. Um, it's really, really good. Do not go like I did in the summer because you will die. It is very, very hot. Do not even go as I also did in November. It's still too hot. My advice is to go in January or February and probably not at any other time of the year. If you don't want to do that, you can um, go to a digital recreation um, online, Nossus has their own, or if you get um, Assassin's Creed Odyssey, they have a museum mode. You can go through uh, the reconstructed Nossos um, in Assassin's Creed Odyssey. It's really, really cool. It's Paula. Let me recommend it. Anyway, 
the so firstly like Crete is like an island um in the Aegean Sea it's in between um Greece and Turkey right and um it was actually occupied uh for longer um by uh the Turkish forces than um a lot of um the rest of Greece even when Greece had its like independence later on um now like the the Cretan dialect is like a little bit different um when you're speaking Greek than um and uh, like the different dialects of Greek that you hear on the mainland, but also um, we have like a lot of evidence for um, for civilizations for um, that were separate to what we think of as like the classical Greek. So, for example, you have like stuff that shows up in the Etruscan myths. Also, you have the Minoans, and um, and when you go through um, a lot of the um, archaeological sites on Crete a bit different it was actually um i was actually reading today that one of the ideas um like in modern reconstructed ideas from the original myth um for the uh the minotaur being in his labyrinth is that because of where crete is they have a lot of earthquakes um which is also great in the summer by the way totally recommend it great fun wonderful way to wake up in the morning but um one of like the the modern like uh uh, reconstructed um, ideas from the myth is the idea that perhaps um, the tremors on the island were caused by the Minotaur being furious and tamping in his labyrinth, which I think is really cool. Um, yeah, I, I really like that. It's not relevant to anything, but it made me smile, so hey. So the story of uh, the Minotaur begins when um, King Minos um, is vying for control of Crete as king um and he's been vying with his brothers right now he needs poseidon's um like basically uh his stamp of approval in order to be um king over his brothers so he petitions poseidon and um and poseidon uh gives him this um incredible bull the cretan bull which is later known as the marathonian bull that was uh theseus's fault so let's not think about that the um the cretan bull um the cretan bull um was uh gorgeous and um it was like this wonderful um white massive, glossy furred, beautiful animal. Now, Poseidon, in giving this animal to uh, King Minos, was expecting it to be sacrificed to him um, as, you know, like a bit of thanks and reward, basic respect for the gods. Uh, King Minos was like, no, this is the sickest bull I've ever seen, I'm keeping it. And, um, and he does some like basic trickery and passes Poseidon off with like some bullshit normal bull and Poseidon's like, uh-uh. So Poseidon does what any normal Greek god does. He goes to Aphrodite and he's like, hey, you know King Minos? And Aphrodite is like, yeah. You know King Minos's wife, Pasiphae? And Aphrodite is like, yeah. You know, this big, beautiful Cretan bull with the with the white fur and the golden horns. It's like really gorgeous and cool. Aphrodite is like, yeah. Can you make Pasiphae fall in love? Um, and by love, I definitely mean lust with the bull. And Aphrodite is like, yes, you sicko. Absolutely, I can. So Pasiphae is in love with the Cretan bull. And... Um, <laughs> You know, because they're just having a normal one on Olympus as ever. And um, the Pasiphae can't fuck the bull like she desperately wants to uh, without being crushed to death because um, it is a gigantic bull. So she goes to Daedalus, uh, Daedalus, the father of Icarus. Uh, their story actually comes uh, not as a result of this story, but in relation to this story. Uh, you know, Icarus, wax, feathers, flying into the sun, stupid twink drowns. That guy, his dad. Daedalus, uh, Pasiphae goes to Daedalus and she's like, hey, can you do me a real one and build me a wooden bull so that this real bull can fuck me? So I'll climb in the mechanical bull and then... Um, the bull will have sex with me thinking that I'm also a bull and also I won't be crushed to death. And Daedalus is like, I mean, okay, 
so he does that and um and pacifay gets in the bull and she has sex with the cretan bull as anyone would and um she becomes pregnant with what would then be known as minotaur a feather minas sterion sterion being uh, the name that they uh gave the child um it's mysterious in hades game i think is it's the latinized version um but yeah great time all around so <laughs> you know not great so far but when um asterion is born firstly your clue is that they gave uh the minotaur name asterion um but secondly um in um a lot of the um say in a lot of in um some of the uh, in the um etruscan de uh, uh, etruscan depictions uh we have pacifay gently bouncing uh the baby asterion on her knee uh, it's very very cute he's got a cow head um so the child being um the result of pacifay's union with the cretan bull um is a uh, half uh bull and half man um it, it it wasn't always necessarily um like a bull on the head of the body there's other depictions where um it's just sort of like a kind of like horned um like more human face and then there's also depictions um like in some like medieval art where it was like a human's head um on the body of a bull which let me tell you really fucked up you can google it i don't recommend you do that and um and then it goes a bit different. So this is like the uh, the original eye, right? So here's Asterion. Now, as Asterion grows, um, he is massive because he is the result of a bull and human, and he's fierce, and they don't want him anywhere. So, um, <laughs> poor Daedalus. So Minos goes to Daedalus, and he's like, hey. And Daedalus is like, oh, no. And he's like, can you please build me a gigantic maze underneath my palace for me to lock my son up? And Daedalus is like, okay. And he does that. Now, this being done, uh, the Minotaur is in the labyrinth. Then you have the Athenian take on the myth. Now it's really, really important to know that um that in antiquity greece was not um a like a whole um uh unit of um of unified uh, stories and ideas many many facets that we see of uh, many of the greek mythological figures uh today um as uh the stories um have been um, like partly uh, constructed from um, the versions that were written down, um, which may differ, may have differed at the time, um, or may have been constructed from multiple um, iterations within oral tradition. Um, and therefore, when you have stories that go from place to place, um, you see certain cultural differences. So, for example, um, like Aphrodite is um, a love goddess in many cults. But being a love goddess, she's also shown as a warrior goddess to other um, in other cults um, around different um, areas and policies, and even through different eras um, within, like what you know, different um, Hellenic spheres. So. Take that into account as you consider um, like this as the basis, right? No mention of, um, of Theseus, who was um, an Athenian hero. Uh, no mention of, uh, crucially, no mention of the Minotaur uh, eating babies um, or indeed um, eating anybody else. Um, the, uh, the Minotaur um, is, <laughs> a monster we'll get into that later on um but like we'll we'll talk about the motivations for locking him in the labyrinth before right so just think of that as one story and then think of this as the sequel by a different studio so then we come to the athenian idea of uh, the minotaur myth they take the idea of minos and um and the minotaur and we go forward. 
So, the reasons for this vary depending on who you talk to. Um, in one of them, like Theseus goes and he like is like, can I have the Cretan bull? Because like he's raging rampage because like he's, you know, Poseidon's furious and blah, blah, blah. Can we just take him? And then Theseus takes him back to uh, the mainland. He catches the, the Cretan bull. And then the, the bull later on gets out and ends up rampaging around Marathon. And then I think it's Perseus that has to deal with it. Oh, no, it's Heracles. Um, anyway, so, you know, there's all this nonsense. Um, but... The, the myth goes, regardless, that there was some sort of conflict between um, the Athenians and Minos, or there was a plague in Athens um, and, uh, and Minos was the cause. By the way, uh, the, the thing that had to be done uh, by the Athenians was to send uh, seven young women and seven young men to Athens um, every seven or nine years or sometimes every year like I said it changes in different iterations from myth to myth um to be sent into the labyrinth and devoured by the minotaur because being a uh, a monster made of the union between bull and man the only thing he could eat was human flesh now I don't know if you've ever seen a human and or a bull but neither of their diets typically contain human flesh um and you know, sometimes when you're Cretan or, you know, when you're a Greek god, two plus two equals uh, incest and some weird traditions. Um, yeah, yeah. Anyway, so the third uh, version, uh, union, uh, sorry, the third iteration of this cycle comes to pass. And, um, and Theseus, our dashing Athenian hero, so desperate to insert Athens into literally anything existing in peace without Athens being involved is like, listen, this has gone on too long. Um, we have to, you know, we'll do something. I will go and kill the Minotaur. This is part of like his labors. Um, so he goes to Crete uh, and, um, and he goes and uh, Ariadne, uh, as in the big, you know, uh, Ideas gives him some gives him some yarn because she's a weaver and he goes into the labyrinth um, and because he can find his way around with the yarn uh, he can get one over on the minotaur and slay him. Worth noting that um, the Etruscans uh, again Theseus they didn't know him, him from Adam and um, Ariadne uh, just hooks up with Dionysus so she's having a great time normally uh, but you know not if you're Athenian. So, firstly, um, like the human flesh thing, gross, whatever. But um, I think this is part of where uh, the idea of like the Minotaur as like um, as highly sexed um, comes in, especially in like modernity. Like if you think of like the the Minotaur um, in the Victorian uh, period of um, talking about um, like especially like child sex trafficking and all that stuff. Uh, the idea of like the minotaur as um as like sexually perverted and predatory um and like especially like thirsting for um for young flesh like the that's where that comes in later on um because like of the idea of like um cannibalism uh, but it's like the, it's the taboo of like consuming uh specifically like young women and young men um but like that's uh, a facet that we can discuss uh in a minute so we, when I say that we look at these two stories as two separate stories and one being um, an addition on the part of the latter, I say it because, um, you know, for the period you're looking at like an, a different idea of like um, cultural perspectives and cultural lenses where naturally uh, one culture wants to look at it from their perspective and insert their own heroes and blah, 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 blah. Not saying that it was like an, an intentional like one up thing um instead like this is just the natural way that things um evolve as they as they move around um and we like discuss like different um folk heroes and iterations of folktale but um but what i really want to discuss is how we go from like those two stories when uh we look at these characters um from the uh the queer and disabled uh perspectives that i mentioned earlier so Firstly, let's talk about um, King Minos. So King Minos um, is greedy 
and um, and he um, wants to keep the Cretan ball because it's just so fucking sick. He really wants to keep it awesome. Um, so he tries to get one over on Poseidon. Now this shows like at its core, like it's more than um, a disrespect for the gods. Um, it is like the, the arrogance and the hubris to think that you can uh, supersede them um, and to think that you can deceive um, the, the gods, um, not because there's an idea of, um, of like them as all knowing, um, but like it's that thing of um, like the fund, it's the level of disrespect. It's not just like, oh, you disrespected me by not doing what I wanted you to do and doing the basic thing. But it's also, uh, you thought that I would fall for this. You thought that I would see this bull, the greatest bull that's ever existed. And I would just take this like heifer, no. So there's that. Then we have um, the fact that, um, that Pasiphae loves Hysterion. Um, her and Minos uh, gave the boy a name. We see her uh, bouncing the child on her knee um, and like holding him, you know, very uh, intimately and lovingly. Um, also, uh, Minos does not kill Asterion. He doesn't uh, swaddle him in blankets and leave him to perish in the cold. Um, he doesn't um, like kill his son. Obviously like in Antiquity, like filicide was like very, very bad. Not quite as bad as patricide, but it was bad. Like we're already talking about somebody who has no respect for um, the gods and their rules and has already uh, gone about them. Even after all this, he still didn't kill the Cretan bull. He still kept it. So, we hold that into account, right? When we examine the Minotaur from um, a modern perspective, and I speak from like a, uh, a queer perspective, particularly a trans perspective, um, and also um, thinking about disability, um, the the Minotaur um, himself is um, is viewed as um, an abomination, um, a an unnatural uh, transgression. Um, strangely enough, we're not actually blaming Pasiphae, which is unusual uh, considering what we normally uh, blame uh, the, the women for in, um, in myths. Uh, um, but like, nonetheless, like there's the idea of like the, the Minotaur um, is transgressing merely for being born, right? Because like, you know, we all know that this is as a result of, um, of King Minos's disrespect for the gods. But, is Asterion who is killed. It is Asterion who is trapped in a labyrinth uh, beneath Knossos. Um, it is um, Asterion who is sent um, these, you know, 14 virgins every seven to nine years uh, to enrich his enclosure. But um, there's no implicate, there's no uh, word that Asterion asked for this. Um, there's the idea that like, you know, as a minute or he can only uh, sustain himself on human flesh, but there's no choice by Asterion, right? Because we don't really think about choices in myth, um, except when they're the choices of kings um, and everybody else is just affected by them. But the reason that I, I talk about his transgression for existing is because when Theseus goes um, to, uh, Sorry. Um, when Theseus goes to um, to Crete to slay the Minotaur, in his eyes, he is correcting something that should already have been done. To Theseus, um, Asterion was already an abomination who has already uh, devoured people, um, and he is correcting what should have been done in the first place. Not being able to correct the initial disrespect of Poseidon, the uh, the correction made is to kill uh, the abomination, uh, Minos' stepson and Pasiphae's son. So this idea of um, transgressing merely by existing, being bestial merely by existing, merely by the virtue of being born, um, he is um, an insult, not to the gods, but to, uh, um, to Athens or to other heroes or, or whoever else. When we think of like how we um, apply that narrative to like modern, um, like so firstly like looking at like modern disabled narratives, um, like often thinking about um, 
about the way um, the, um, that certain uh, neurodivergences and mental disabilities are treated. Um, especially when you think of like, especially like physically large um, men um, who are autistic or who have Down syndrome or um, or who have other like uh, neurodivergences, mental disabilities or um, like um, birth defects that lead to, um, to any kind of like mental issue. But then also looking at um, physical, deform physical deformity, um, uh, like even like facial scarring, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. You, you have um, these cultural attitudes, even within modern society, of, um, of hiding the child from the eyes of society. Um, now you can look at it um, from the idea of, um, oh, we're doing this for the child's own good to save them from the cruelty of society. Because the easiest way to, um, to deal with the cruelty of society, as we all know, is always to uh, not correct the cruelty of society in any way, especially if you are the king of a powerful nation, and instead to lock your child um, in a enclosure and make sure that nobody can see it. Um, so we look at it from that perspective, especially because, um, like, we don't know anything about um, the Minotaur except for his, like, odd and peculiar diet, and also the fact that, like, very intelligent um, and trapped in a goddamn maze. So it's that aspect, but especially because we know that Pasiphae um, loved Asterion and bounced him on her knee, and that it was only later as he grew, um, like, you know, went through puberty effectively, that he became, like, unwieldy and difficult to control. And it's the difficult to control aspect that always comes into play here, uh, because um, what is the point of um, uh, a child if you can't physically control uh, or restrain them? Uh, to the average uh, abled uh, neurotypical parent. So you, you have like that cultural attitude still in place today, right? Um, especially because like the Minotaur, like just looking at him, you are aware um, that he is uh, wrong and is a transgression, uh, a monster. Looking at it from um, a trans perspective and specifically like a queer perspective as well, um, you're looking at um, at someone who is outside of like um, of what we consider like normal gender, because uh, the Minotaur is never going to be viewed um, as a man. By definition, he is um, half man. Um, but also because of like the association with like the bull's uh, virility, there's like an element of hypermasculinity, especially when we consider um, like the the Minotaur as um, as like a, a figure of. Um, of like rape and sexual assault and specifically like um, sexual, um, not hunger, but ravenousness um, that comes into like our modern perceptions of the Minotaur as monster. Now, this plays into um, like perceptions of, um, of queerness and transness specifically, but I'll get to that in a minute. The, the thing that I'm uh, bringing uh, both of these things up to emphasize is that um, again, Asterion did not, um, Asterion was not killed at birth, um, was instead uh, trapped in a labyrinth. Now, that is already in itself um, like a, a, an idea of like mercy on um, King Minos's part because he's not killing his own stepson, who he's not related to by birth, by the way. Um, which like, I'm not saying that as if like, oh, it's fine for you to murder your stepchildren. I say it because in antiquity, <laughs> that would have been more of the attitude. Um, you know, because Pasiphae loved him. But there's also that idea of like um, the labyrinth. Um, why a labyrinth? Because it's it's a complex place. So it's a place to um, to like keep the the Minotaur um, occupied and stop him from getting out. Um, and that way, you can look at it as um, as like a gilded cage. But crucially, it's about Minos uh, ensuring that other people do not see him. Because uh, Minos with the Cretan bull um, just let him like fucking roam the wilds and he was like causing havoc until somebody else came and captured him. Whereas the Minotaur is contained, the Minotaur is hidden, the Minotaur is underground. The, the thing about um, Asterion and his existence, right, his, this idea of like his transgression by existing, but like the thing about his transgression is that it's not um, Asterion's fault. Asterion 
um, is the evidence of um, Pasiphae's lying with the Cretan bull, and there, therefore the evidence of King Minos's uh, defiance of the gods and disrespect of the gods um, of Poseidon. So though the reason to hide the Minotaur um, when we think of uh, Minos's perspective is not merely to contain a monster because he can contain the monster anywhere. It's about um, ensuring that he's hidden, ensuring that others don't see him. Um, so again, that plays into ideas of uh, cultural ideas of disability um, and the idea of like hiding a child that, um, that brings the family into uh, disrepute merely by existing. Um, and also like um, specifically as a challenge to other people's comfort um, is like the big, big thing about um, like uh, removing uh, the rights and autonomy of disabled people and specifically like ensuring that disabled people um, as a whole are excluded from mainstream society. It has nothing to do with um, disabled people's actual uh, needs or abilities or their own autonomies it is almost entirely always to do with the comfort of abled people, their discomfort uh, looking at disabled people, being reminded that disabled people exist, thinking of disabled people as agents um, of their own bodies um, and destinies rather than as um, objects um, or like inconveniences to be locked away and to be controlled and to be cared for. Um, but in the way that you care for um, like a family heirloom you don't much like, as opposed to cared for in the way that you do as human, or worse, cared for as a child, an eternal child, because you continually want to um, deny that person their autonomy. From a trans perspective, particularly, how many people today, um, especially like young trans people, but I talk about trans people in general, queer people in general, but especially from a trans perspective, how many people um, are trapped um, in their closets, unable to, uh, to present as the gender they choose, use the pronouns they choose, um, oppressed and, um, and controlled by a family that, um, that perhaps uh, they, they don't like, or a family anyway, regardless of, of whether they love them, um, undermine their gender identity. Um, and then, uh, you know, are, are trapped in, a, in an enclosure, in a labyrinth of their own making, and who then, within uh, that confinement, um, explore, like, you know, sure, video games. I mean, like, you know, throughout uh, transgender history, we have, like, a huge, huge history of, um, of trans people uh, innovating within virtual worlds. I mean, not just, like, the Wachowski sisters, but, like, you know, most of, like, uh, modern computing inventions, um, a lot of, like, modern music, um, you know, heralded and, um, and speared by trans women every time. This idea that, um, that when uh, pressed in by physical confinement and that physical confinement is not caused out of um, a desire to be physically confined it's being uh, physically confined um, either by society or in this case like specifically and intentionally by um, a controlling parental figure um, and in order to exercise a feeling of control of sensation of autonomy um, who then act out within a virtual reality so the, and I, I, the way I draw this to the Minotaur is, um, is even if he is asking for the men and women sent uh, to him every year, those are people that are brought into his enclosure, um, into the labyrinth, um, and therefore like are within his bounds of physical confinement and he can do um, as he pleases with them. Um, like it's it's that thing of um, it's such a, it's such a trans feeling of um, of being uh, trapped and therefore exercising any control that you can because you are denied autonomy um, in case uh, you, uh, you uh, bring shame to your, your parents um, or because your parents are exercising a physical um, or like otherwise control over you. So when we think of this, right, when we think of uh, the Minotaur um, from this uh, perspective, if you also think of like Pasiphae too, like Pasiphae is like a loving figure um, over Asterion. Um, the idea of Pasiphae um, who loved her son, um, even from his, her perspective, 
uh, keeping him trapped for his own good, if you want to look at like Minos and Pasiphae as like um, having different ideas. Because I think that Minos can want to um, like care for his son and keep him uh, confined and therefore safe, um, while also caring about his own reputation. Whereas Pasiphae obviously has um, like the Kylix anyway, um, has a different motivation. So when we consider uh, the Minotaur from these perspectives, right, whether you consider it from disabled or whether you consider it Consider it from queer perspectives. I don't. I don't say this to, by the way, um, like put specific labels of um, of like disability or of queer or transness onto um, Asterion as a figure, uh, because um, I think it's. I don't think it's useful for for what I'm trying to illustrate here, um, because like you can go into like the specific like taxonomy of queer or disabled identity, but. Um, but like that, that's more useful for a specific story, not as a as a general lens, uh, because you can you can uh, you can interpret it in different ways. But when we then look to um, to Theseus, who comes from Athens, um, so we look at Asterion, who has no choice, um, who is not um, asked, and why would he be asked? Who is confined? Who is sent uh, these um, young people to entertain him um, or feed him? Uh, Theseus comes to kill the Minotaur. Um, and the reason that the Minotaur needs to be killed is because the Minotaur is a beast. The reason that the Minotaur is a beast is because he is an aberration, a transgression, an abomination. Merely by existing, he deserves to die. The Minotaur, crucially, is trapped in a labyrinth. Um, nobody has to send uh, young people in there. I know that Minos does, but they, they don't have to. Theseus could just as easily have gone to Minos and stopped this. But instead, what he wanted to do was kill the Minotaur. The Sterion shares in common uh, this with uh, Medusa from Perseus's labors. Uh, both Medusa and Asterion are, um, are transgressions merely by existing. Uh, Asterion is a transgression uh, because um, he is the product of an unsacred union. Uh, Medusa um, is a transgression for existing because um, the way that Medusa uh, gained her um, petrification um, sphere um, is because um, she was raped and in order to, and she prayed that she couldn't be um, attacked in such a way again. And Athena assured that she couldn't be attacked again. But because she's then um, in her own space, not going out anywhere, but because she is a woman having the audacity to exist and nobody can rape her, she must die. And that is the is the core of um, of Medusa's story. She she is she is a monster because she cannot be abused and she cannot be attacked and she cannot be victimized. And if um, she cannot be sexually victimized, if she cannot be debased in that way, then she must die. And um, I hate hate Perseus. <laughs> anyway, um, so uh, so that like story is in one thing. But like Asterion and Medusa have in common, they are trapped. They cannot go anywhere. They are in one place. And people go into this confinement where they are, where they cannot leave, kill them because they are abominations and they must be killed because they are existing and they are existing wrong. And how are they existing wrong? Because you can't yoke a minotaur and you can't rape Medusa. And that's the, the core and crux of the matter. It's, it's about, um, about control and domination over, um, this is like the real fear of, um, of aberration in the first place. It's about not being able to control. It's about not being able to fit them into society um, or societies in the state, uh, in the case of the policies and city states. So When we, um, when we think of that with um, what I've already said about disability and transness, 
um, specifically thinking about a modern turf rhetoric. Um, well, it's not even modern. It's not even modern. The idea of um, of queer people and um, queer people, like especially like in the um, in the seventies and eighties. I mean, before then, obviously for centuries. But like, if if we think most recently um, around uh, the the AIDS crisis, um, not even thinking about um, the the Victorian uh, witch trials um, and uh, the um, the abuse by the state of um, of Oscar Wilde and um, and similar figures when we think of um, queerness and transness, not only as aberrations merely by existing, especially uh, trans people, especially trans women, trans women are far more likely to be, uh, be victimized by this because of trans misogynistic ideals. Um, it's that idea of um, by existing, you are victimizing young people. And so uh, we look um, again at the hypersexualized minotaur uh, the Minotaur as a symbol of hypervirility and um, and sexual um, abuse um, with uh, ravenous appetites that cannot be contained, even though he's literally contained right now. He's contained anyway. Um, therefore, uh, Theseus is a hero, just like Perseus was. Theseus is a hero because um, he kills the monster that cannot be tamed, uh, that, um, that has a hunger that cannot be tamed. Um, he kills the monster that is uh, is victimizing young people merely by being alive, even though he didn't ask for it. He was just existing, and not only existing, but existing in confinement, existing already within a very, very small bounds of freedom. Um, so, like that's big trans vibes, queer vibes in general, specifically like trans vibes because um, of like current uh, like modern um, attacks on uh, trans people. As I said, trans women specifically, does apply to trans people in general, uh, because I mean, just thinking about trans men as stolen lesbians uh, plays into the same idea of, um, of uh, naivety being the, um, the, ob the, the, the reason for queer youth's existence rather than youth being queer. Um, Throughout everything I've said so far, the the way that we're looking at this is quite different from the way that we normally look at um, uh, mythological perspectives. And the reason that it's different is because we're thinking of these um, individuals, uh, Minos, Pasiphae, um, not yet Asterion himself, um, and um, Theseus. As, um, as people with individual motivations and prejudices, which I think is really, really crucial when we explore um, our own biases, when exploring stories and our own takes on stories. Um, we think of, we can think of Minos as, um, as firstly, like, you know, someone who disrespected the gods and needs to safeguard his reputation, but also doesn't kill his stepson. He doesn't kill Asterion. Not only is Asterion named, not only does Asterion go through uh, puberty and become um, an adult, whatever that means for a minotaur, um, he is not killed. He is not left to starve to death, uh, even in even if you believe like the Athenian edition of, um, of the minotaur feasting on human bodies. Minos, in that version of the myth, sources bodies, um, real uh, young people to sacrifice to his son. Um, he is his son, you know, stepson, foster son, whatever you want to call it, but the son who is named, the son who lives under his palace, the son for whom um, he makes himself responsible. I'm not saying this to paint Minos as like, you know, a dutiful father figure because the whole thing is very bad, but you're, you're still going to those lengths um, to, uh, to protect and foster someone who is not your blood. And not only that, but is the, the direct result of your, um, your arrogance, your hubris, your stupidity and your disrespect. Pasiphae, who loves um, her son, named him, raised him, placed him on her knee. Theseus, who, um, who saw a monster um, the need of uh, defeat um, and wreaked havoc in the process um, and stole Dionysus' girlfriend. Um, Asterion. There are, like, obviously, there are stories that go into um, Asterion's uh, motivations um, and his own um, ideas. Um, the, the House of Asterion, um, I think, is the way uh, Louis Borges' uh, story. Um, 
what does Asterion think of his predicament? We don't know. How much um, aware is he of his confinement? Does he see as it? Does he, does he see it as confinement? Does he see it as his um, lair or his kingdom? Um, does he know that he is the son of a king? Does he feel that he has a right to the throne? Does he feel um, angry? Does he feel trapped? Does he feel sad? Does he feel rejected? Uh, does he yearn for the outside or does it frighten him because um, of what he's been told about um, who he is and what he is? How much have his parents told him? I don't know. But thinking of Asterion from um, a disabled perspective or from uh, a queer and trans perspective, um, either way, um, there are levels of um, exploration and lenses to explore. I haven't actually gone into uh, the disability as much as the queer and transness, but the reason that I bring both into perspective is because when we look at stories, when we look at, um, at you know, myths in general, whatever media we consume, we as people having multiple facets to our identities um, are always able to look at things from multiple lenses. But the thing is that it's very, very easy to look through all of them at once, uh, like we're looking through the multiple lenses, you know, like the opticians as opposed to separating out um, what makes us think of a story in one way or the other, taking apart those lenses and looking at it one by one, um, which is why it can be so valuable to look at a text and look at it from, um, from a feminist perspective, from a historical perspective, um, from um, a perspective of um, examining uh, cultural uh, rhetoric and racism, from a perspective examining uh, political, uh, political context of the time. The reason that it is valuable for us to um, take apart our own biases and see which of our biases is affecting each of our opinions at this moment, which of our experiences is affecting each of these biases in the moment. Um, and then being able to look at them um, in concord and see what they produce as a whole. Um, and what happens if you take one away and leave the other three in place. Um, it's very, very uh, valuable when um, exploring uh, things like this. The, the big thing about these stories is that um, when we look at things through the oral tradition, um, we often um, explore there's just names rather than uh, whole people with, um, with different potential motivations. Motivations that may or may not contradict one another because we as people have motivations that contra contradict one another um or the the ones that work in concord uh with each other um the things that confirm our biases confirm our comfort um and the places where that concord turns to contradiction or vice versa um is really really valuable to think about but um love i love this story um i've gotten uh quite i've gotten deep and quiet now because i'm like ha ah. but um but the thing about like the the minotaur is that he can represent so much. Going away from those perspectives, you can also look at the Minotaur as, um, as, as like I said, a symbol of um, of uh, virility, ravenousness, uh, barbarian um, appetites. Um, uh, you know, rep rem re representative of man's um, lust and hunger and greed, uh, particularly because Minos, uh, in the first place, um, acted out of greed in the first place um but it, it just depends it depends on how you look at it and um i think that um i think that i really really enjoy about um uh, more and more recent uh presentations of the minotaur is that um as uh, normal people like disabled people and queer and trans people rather than you know um as normal people um like come into contact with characters like these and reimagine them we end up with um with far more um sympathetic and complex ideas of um of these stories because like naturally we empathize with the characters who are like us um and i would say that Asterion is uh, is like us um not necessarily most of all but certainly more than most um yeah i uh, i really love him 
I had one more thing and I've forgotten what it was. Um, and it was going to be just before my conclusion. Now I've forgotten what it was. Um, and I kind of just made a lot of my conclusion thinking that it would come to me and it didn't come to me. So I'll just end it there. Um, but yeah, I hope it gave everybody food to thought. Like I said, um, like the point of, um, of this talk is really about um, encouraging uh, different perspectives. It's really, really useful as a creator to be able to, um, to take apart um, your own biases and ask critical questions um, about those biases because without being able to do that um, you creativity is worthless without uh, self-critique not because you need to contain that creativity because you can't actually be creative when you're always in a box you have to be able to see that the box is there um, and that's the really important thing about being able to take apart um, stories and characters like this um, and then them back together um, because you need to be able to see the mechanism uh, before you can make adjustments um, and that's always the case with our um, our lens and our um, consumption of media but also crucially in our um, creation of media and our um, critique and um, an analysis of that media um, I can't you know can't begin to, um, to over understate it um, I had another nice picture of the, the Minotaur and um, my presentation doesn't want to work. Let's just end it there. Let's just pretend there were no other pictures. It's just this one. It's really cute. It's burping him. <laughs>